book of 1 Timothy is a pastoral epistle written by Paul the Apostle. It's one of his final letters to his protege and spiritual son, a young pastor named Timothy. And although the letter is intended for his ministry life, the content transcends and applies to the Church of Jesus Christ. Within this letter is the most explicit and complete instructions for church leadership and administration. Not only is the Christian's character of utmost importance, but also the church's culture is of spiritual significance. From the qualifications of elders and deacons to the quality of the times and seasons, this letter teaches the believer to guard the truth of the gospel against spiritual treason. And that is why 1 Timothy is a perfect template to follow for life and ministry. Because when we submit to the inspiration and course correction of this letter, the church will be purer, her people bolder, and the gospel clearer. The book of 1 Timothy. Dear church, this is your charge. All right, plenty to share. A word to those who want to be wise. We say a word to the wise. A word to those that want to be wise when it comes to their, their marriages. A quick word about that before we swing our way into new verses. Marriage is a two-way street, right? It's 100% on each side. Each person being willing to engage 100%. It's not a 50-50 contract, not 51%, 49%. It's a covenant. And each of us as Christians are held to a standard. And God, he works in the midst of two messy, broken people and he makes them one. And what he has brought together, Jesus said, let no man put asunder. Translation, let nothing divide your marriage. Let nothing put a wedge between you and your spouse. I know many of you are hanging on by a thread. Your marriage is on the rocks, seemingly gone. I'm asking you to trust God. No circumstance or situation is beyond redemption. No marriage is irreconcilable. Trust God and he will work in his timing. Marriage is hard. Relationships are hard. If anyone says they're not, they are lying. Now, yes, marriage is mature. Our couples who have been married for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, they'll tell you times in their marriage that were struggles and their love matured yeah, they'll probably bicker and have disagreements in their latter years of their marriage, but of course, they came to a place where they got into each other in such a way that those times of conflict have been decreased. Pastor Gene and I have the honor of meeting every single Wednesday, and I love hearing about his ministry journey, but more importantly, the sweetness between him and his present bride, Suzanne, it just really ministers to my soul. I hope you never forget that, my brother. It's like the guy that was only invited on stage for the marriage panel because he had been married for almost 40 years. They wanted to know the secret to his success. So they asked him, tell us, almost 40 years? What have you been doing? He says, well, I've learned to listen. I've also learned to take my wife wherever she wants to go. Really, that's it? Yep, she wants to go somewhere, and I take her. When did that begin? It began, he said, for our fifth year anniversary. She wanted to go to Italy, so I took her to Italy. Wow, almost 40 years later? Yep, every five years, I go back and check on her to see how she's doing. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> now let's get serious. Here's what will kill a marriage, and I thought about this deeply. What kills a marriage isn't that it runs out of rom romance. What kills a marriage is that it runs away from repentance. If one or both parties are unwilling to engage in repentance, what settles in is unforgiveness, and unforgiveness will kill a marriage. Let's get into the new content. 
First Timothy chapter four, verse six, of course, is Paul's reminder to Timothy to continue to instruct the church in these things. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Consider that Paul is saying to Timothy, if you instruct the church in these things, and ultimately these things are basically verses one to five so far. Basically chapter one, verse one, to chapter four, verse five so far. These things that were laid out, but more explicitly, these things that Paul is saying to Timothy that he needs to instruct the brethren in was the apostasy or defection, which was happening then, it's happening now. He said, be mindful of deception, seductive spirits. And then he talked about demonic doctrines. And he added to the demonic doctrines the forbidding of marriage, we talked about that last Sunday, and the abstaining from certain foods. In these things, instruct the brethren. I like the word instruct here. In Greek, it actually means the underlying pattern that is to be traced. Now, if you were like me when I was younger, I would enjoy putting a clear piece of paper or a computer piece of paper over something to trace it, to draw it. That's the idea here. The minister simply lays out before the church the underlying pattern that which you are expected to trace with your life. Peter would write even more, listen to this, even more explicitly about Jesus himself. He said, for to this you are called, that you would be able to engage in suffering because Christ is the example. Wait, what? And the word example in the Greek, it's a writing tablet. And the students, especially the Jewish students, were expected to learn the alphabet. And the alphabet would be traced on a writing uh, tablet. And they would trace, you ready? The letters alpha to omega. And the idea of Jesus being our example is that we trace his life from alpha to omega. That's why the scriptures are so important to know. It's the underlying pattern by which we place our lives over to trace. What are these things that Paul is warning Timothy to instruct the church about. He gave a long list to look out for. These are identified as the coming apostasy. I said it's defection. The coming deception through false teachers, false prophets, the twisted truths that the enemy propagates, unbiblical legalistic teachings of all forms. You have legalism, you have liberalism, all of which are a result of misinterpreting the word of God. And when you misinterpret the word of God, you misrepresent God himself. Did you get that? If you're one inch off from launch, do you have any idea how far off you will be upon landing? There's a science behind it. One degree off without course correcting. By the end of the journey, you will be so far off and people start out with one degree off from the true Jesus. The minister is commissioned as a shepherd would be to a flock. Here's the sad reality though for the Christian context. To address certain issues of our day or even call out or expose error is to find yourself labeled unloving or intolerant. Nobody wants to be called unloving or intolerant. So sadly, many people in my position begin to cower to the pressures of man or the fears of man. Because I don't wanna be identified as somebody who is intolerant. So I'm not gonna address the issues of our day. That is shirking my responsibility as a minister or a pastor, as a shepherd, I am called to not just feed the flock. If I'm only feeding you every single Sunday, I'm fattening you up for the kill from the wolves. 
I also, as the elders are compelled to, protect the flock. Now, this is true for every Christian. It's not just for certain super Christians. There are none. A great deal of the Apostle Paul's ministry was spent calling out false teaching, identifying false doctrine. You won't find a single letter that he wrote that he is not at some point identifying something that was attacking the church. He, he was spending most of his ministry correcting people. And, and a lot of times, the most loving thing one can do is bring correction and tell the truth. The word minister here, before we move on, is the word generally for deacon. Not the office of deacon, just the identification of what it means to be a servant of the Most High God. All of us that call ourselves Christians need to aspire to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Every father, every mother, every husband, every wife, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. What, do, what does that imply? It means as many are departing from biblical truth, you yourself who wanna be a good minister, you never stop imparting biblical truth. Never stop speaking gospel truth to your marriage, to your family. Never allow the world or the lies of the culture to stop you from imparting biblical truth. Never stop discerning the lies. Never stop, as I said last Sunday, exorcising, exorcising darkness, E-X-O-R. Casting out and driving out darkness. At the same time, never stop exercising yourself unto godliness, E-X-E-R. And that's what we're gonna spend the rest of our time looking at, exercising ourselves unto godliness. Notice in verse six, it says that if Timothy does this, he's nourished by the words of faith and of the good doctrine, which he not just speaks, he lives. There's no disconnect behind the minister's presentation or speaking, what you say or what you do. The goal is that what you're saying, you're following, practicing what you preach. Timothy has nourished himself off of the words of faith he is speaking. I love that. Timothy himself is strengthened based off of the doctrine he's living. Did you know that Jesus himself in John 4 said something so profound? He found himself seated at a well, weary from the journey. He sits, he sends his disciples to the nearby village to get food. Hungry they were. I don't wanna get lost in the details of who he encountered, the divine appointment he had with the woman at the well. In fact, it's an exhausting conversation. Jesus told her about herself. He touched a nerve, which otherwise the culture would say that was unloving Jesus. He touched her nerve because he wanted to bring her out of shame and introduce her to his grace. At the end of the encounter, she leaves transformed. She becomes an evangelist for the gospel. Remember, the disciples come back. Jesus had just done some ministry. In the meantime, the disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. He said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, his disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Did you get that? What was it that sustained Jesus? Was it physical food? No, in this moment, it was spiritual food. That he himself was nourished by the words of faith that he spoke. And it's true for us. If the Son of God, the example, the template, the writing tablet, the one we are to trace, here tells us that he finds his ultimate sustenance, his food, from doing the will of God. I give you full permission, and you should. If you've ever seen me looking tired, exhausted, in ministry we call it burnout, but I'm gonna bring you into a secret. I get energized from administering God's word and from studying it all week long. I am feeding my soul all week long. And that needs to be true for all of us. 
Jeremiah himself said, your words were found and I ate them. And they to me were joy and rejoicing of heart. Jeremiah 15, 16. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 103, get this. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Verse 104, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Did you see what happens there? The more understanding and wisdom and knowledge you have, the more you will despise and hate the opposite. And the most famous verse in Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. We don't have time to get into the fact that Ezekiel was instructed to consume a scroll or John, the apocalyptic equivalent to Ezekiel, Revelation was instructed to eat a scroll. But the idea is that they were eating God's word and there was a sweetness. John had bitterness of stomach because he knew exactly the revelations of judgment that he was instructed to record. And sometimes that's the response when you have God's word inside of you in such a way, you're not only sustained, you're not only nourished, you're not only strengthened, faith comes by, faith comes by, and hearing by the word of God, the word of God administered. Now, if we're being honest, and only you can answer this, have you been feeding on God's word? In the same way we feed our stomach or our appetites. In the same way that we indulge on the things of the flesh. Would there not be an equivalent or I would say even more emphasis on the intake of the spiritual man or woman? That we would read the word of God so that it sustains us and nourishes us because verse seven, then he tells us, I'm asking you to consider the words you're instructing the church and you're a good minister. If you do that, you'll be nourished by the very words you speak and by the life you live. That's doctrine and duty, but reject, he says, profane and old wives fables, verse seven, and exercise yourself toward godliness. Verse seven is a setup. Of course, to accept godliness, or God's word, you also have to simultaneously reject cotton candy and fluff, or as he calls it, profane and old wives' fables. Old wives' fables, it was a common expression amongst the intellectual elite, talking about fanciful tales, pagan myths, silly and fictitious stories. Reject that which is profane and exercise yourself unto godliness. Reject what is worldly. Reject it. Accept, protect, and project what is godly. That's the Christian's responsibility. Can I give it to you? Just kind of with wordplay. What are we to focus on? God's word, not man's word. Care about what is eternal, not temporal. Scripture, not culture. Godliness, not worldliness, just like that. God's word, not man's word, not man's spin on justice, not man's spin on truth, not man's spin on sexuality, not man's spin on love, not man's spin on heaven or hell. And exercise ourselves toward godliness. A good word to replace with godliness is godlikeness. Not in the sense like, I am like God. And there's teachings out there that say you can be lowercase g gods. That's heresy. But to be like God is to have the characteristics and qualities of God. And that can only, listen, that can only happen by being connected to God, where his life comes out of your life. Or as Jesus said, life on top of life. I came that you might have, you ready? Life and life. You know what that means? I came that you would have life now and life forever, but I came so that you can have heaven on top of earth. That's why I came. And the reason many of us are struggling with life now is because we're listening to the lies of hell. And hell wants to hold you down and take you down. And only heaven can lift you up. It takes the word of God and having a relationship with him himself 
and a community of believers to come alongside of you to do what God has called you to do. I will echo what I said earlier. You cannot go at it alone. You can't. Exercise. This is a Greek word. Some translations, it says train. Exercise or train. It's gymnazo in Greek. It is the English word gymnasium. Gymnastics. It can be translated exercise or discipline. The word speaks of a rigorous, strenuous, self-sacrificial training that every athlete undergoes. Every athlete that has their eyes on a prize is willing to, ready? Exercise or train. The Greek word train literally means, I'm not making this up, you can look it up, to exercise naked. I know, so for all the weirdos amongst us, don't get any ideas. There's a beach in Cape May for that. Here at Landmark, we put on Christ and then we put on our clothes. But it means that because in the Greek culture, remember the genesis of the Olympics and prime athletics really has its origin in Greece. In the Greek language, of course, to exercise or train, they would literally take off their clothes because they reasoned that the weight of any articles of clothing were weighing them down. And of course, to get maximum return on your hard work and investment. It's very similar to what the writer of Hebrews wrote in chapter 12, verse one. Do you remember it? Therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, chapter 11, what did he say next? Lay aside every, every weight and the sin that ensnares. Take off anything in your life that is hindering you from what? running your race, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who is the example, who for the joy set before him, the prize, endured the cross, despising and rejecting the shame which would have debilitated him. This is what it takes to be a Christian who is willing to pursue and exercise themselves toward godliness. This is why verse eight tells us, hey, I'm not saying don't work out physically. Paul says, Tim, bodily exercise profits a little. There is a benefit to physical exercise. My gym enthusiasts in here, you know what it takes. It's a lifestyle. What we eat, how we diet, the time commitment to get into the gym, how we're working out, specific muscles, there's a science to it. We all understand that. And now if gym's not your thing or working out's not your thing, you know that it takes effort to accomplish projects. Your job requires some type of mental or physical capacity, hard work. Now, if we put the effort in physically, I guess what God wants his church to hear is are we willing to do the same amount of work spiritually? Bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. What is godliness profitable for? All things. Having promise of the life that is now and the life that is to come. So there's this compounded impact of godliness, not just for something future-oriented, for eternity. Notice it says godliness is profitable for now. How we're working out our faith now, now make no mistake, exercising your life towards godliness is not glamorous, but it is glorious. Not glamorous because the saying goes, no pain, no gain. Is that what we say? True. Do you wanna know what grieves one of your pastors? Weak and woke Christianity which is unwilling to put the work in, unwilling to study the show themselves approved, unwilling to know the full counsel of God's word. I'll tell you guys, it's easy to say, let's just love each other. Jesus is love. Jesus came to be your best buddy. Oh no, he did not. He came to be your savior. And if he's not your savior, he's one day going to be your judge. 
and how we work out our salvation. Philippians 2. I found this gem in Hebrews 13, 9. Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. Interesting, right? First century church was exposed to all types of extra biblical teachings. For it is good that the heart be established by grace. And I looked up the word established. It means the heart is to be strengthened by grace. Grace then is something that can strengthen us. Grace doesn't make us weaker as Christians. There's nothing sloppy about grace. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God and his grace was with me, which enabled me to work or labor more abundantly or harder than everyone else. Yet not I, but the grace that was with me. I love that. It's the grace sandwich. God's grace, by God's grace, I am who I am. I'm working harder because God's grace is energizing me, sustaining me, yet I recognize it's not me at all. It's by God's grace. Paul also said, and he often used athletic analogy, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. He's like, anyone that's going into the games or goes into a race or a wrestling match, they do so under strict training. Why? All race, only one wins the prize. Then he transitions to his spiritual point. There's always a physical analogy, right? Exercise, physical, I get that. Spiritual application. He then said, during the course of disciplining oneself to obtain a prize, they do so with temperance. They're organized. They're willing to do whatever it takes, dieting, working out, hours in the gym. They submit their body, you ready? To win a prize or a crown. He says a perishable crown. He's like, how much more then should the Christian, using the same strenuous, rigorous, self-discipline to win a crown or obtain a crown that lasts forever. If your household was like mine growing up, I'm one of four boys. I'm the baby of the four. All of us played every sport you can imagine. Our parents did a phenomenal job helping us find our niche, what sport we excelled at. I played soccer and basketball, obviously went to college for soccer and played beyond college as a pro. All of our bedrooms growing up were filled with trophies and plaques and medals and banners. You would not even believe your eyes if you came to my home and saw how many trophies four boys accumulated. And we were always dominant in our sport. And I don't say that with any arrogance. We always found a way to win. You know, I have none of those trophies to this day. I have no idea where they're at. I guess when I left, my mom and dad looked for the nearest recycling bin and (laughs) what's my point? My point is not that those memories don't matter or that having your children compete for championships or athleticism doesn't matter. I'm saying all of that one day is gonna burn up. None of that lasts. The only thing that will last, it says, the imperishable crowns that the Christian receives for the way they serve Christ and his cause. That's it. That's it. Here's the equation. God works in as godliness godliness is worked out. Did you get that? Now just fill in the blank. God works in my marriage as godliness is worked out of my marriage. God works in my family as godliness is worked out in my family. God is willing to work in my life as godliness is worked out in my life. God works in my gifting as godliness is worked out in my gifting. God works in my resources as godliness is worked out of my resources. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. People misunderstand what this is saying. One of the translations is work out your own salvation with serious, critical, biblical thought, with a healthy reverence of who God is, a holiness, a wonder and awe, A-W-E, of who he is. Take your Christian walk seriously. That's what it's saying. 
Why do I do that? Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Did you get that? You work out, he works in. Verse 10, for to this end, in light of all of that, we both labor, it's a reiteration of this spiritual exercise and suffer reproach. Translations might say, and strive. The reason why both work is the word strive means agonize, like a wrestler would on the mat. So we labor, we work hard as Christians. We know our work doesn't save us, We know God worked in Christ on the cross. That's our salvation. But in light of that gift, I wanna work out my salvation. Working out salvation is your sanctification. It's being willing to be honest and assess, look at me, assess yourself. And all of us, if we're being honest, would say, you know what? I've put off reading the word of God. At the end of the day, I'm tired. I've neglected praying with my spouse. I've stopped attending that ministry group because I've allowed that to be replaced by other things. All of us would be able to say, you know what, you're right. There's more of me to give because Christ has given me himself. So I labor, I suffer reproach, which means you're going to suffer shame for being a Christian. You are going to be misunderstood in a world that is often valueless or moralless. Standing for truth in a truthless world, do you expect to be liked? No, Jesus said, the world hates me. And because it hated me, it is going to hate you. And because you're not of the world, I've chosen you out of the world. I've hand-selected you. You're in it, but you're not of it. Expect the shame. Expect the hate. How do I endure? He says, because we trust in the living God. Here's your endurance because you're trusting in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Now a word to that one line, savior of all men. It does not mean all men are saved. It means there's only one savior for man. That's all that means. He's the savior of the world, but you have to choose him to be saved from the world. So how do we put this all together? What's the bow that I would tie on the end of a message like this? Well, I can tell you with 100% certainty, without any doubt, everything you are going through right now, as hard as it is, the hard work, the hardship, I'm telling you, it's all worth it. You wanna know why it's all worth it? Because God is worthy. That's why it's worth it. It's worth it because he is worthy. And if you are believing in a living God, a living and active God, I tell you, brothers and sisters, he becomes your defender. He is the one that will defend his own. He's the one that will defend his family. We're gonna end right now by singing a song or two that should orient our faith our Christian walk, our lives, everything attached to us right now. If I can have your undivided attention, everything that is attached to you, there's an enemy that wants to tear it apart. But you serve a living God who sees you and has you set apart. And as one who is set apart, life's gonna come with challenges. Life is gonna come with conflict. Life is going to be hard. Hardships are going to fall. But if you keep your eyes and your mind on the fact that a God in heaven sees you and he's alive and he is well and he is sovereign, then it is worth it. Because not a single thing that can happen in this world can happen without God's consent. I haven't said this in a long time. I feel like it's appropriate. Look at me really quickly. Some of you need to hear this. If it's touched your life, It had to pass through the scarred hands of Jesus Christ. It's how much he loves us. So I'm asking you to search your hearts as we sing. If you feel like you need to come forward with your spouse, with your children, with yourself, 
come forward. If you have to get on your knees, there's no judgment here. In fact, we encourage that. God honors brokenness. He works through brokenness. The time of playing church, comfortable Christianity, that stopped in 2020. So let me pray for us as we, we end by singing songs. So Father in heaven, here we are again. And I even pray now that we would understand what's at stake, how your voice is speaking. And I pray, oh God, your people are hearing. I pray we're listening. I pray that we would respond, that you would be given complete access in our hearts. We would sing you songs right now, declaring that you are our defender. And regardless of what's surrounding us, those that are with us are greater than those that are against us. So I pray marriages and families find healing. But we know it begins with us. So I pray that in the name of Jesus, amen. Please stand.